Okay, so um, hi, my name is Gordon. I'm a data scientist at the city of Cape Town, but in this talk, I'm just gonna be talking in my private capacity. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is a way to do data pipelines. Um, and don't worry if you don't know what a data pipeline is, I'm gonna go into that. Um, but basically, it's a particular paradigm using some software from Apache called Apache Airflow, along with Docker, which I presume probably more of you will be familiar with. And maybe if you're feeling exciting, you can go, for, uh, go, go to Kubernetes. So, what I'm gonna cover in this talk is pretty much why you wanna do this to yourself, um, what do you get from using these three distinct components, and so why you might want to use them, um, some practical tips on how to start doing this right now, and then a little bit of reflection on uh, why this might be a bad idea, and uh, how you can potentially do this, uh, you know, what are some ideas I have for how this could be done better. Okay. So to start off with, why do you want a data pipeline? Um, and uh, I've quite cheekily put, because I very desperately want a data engineer, but data pipelines is pretty much what I get. Um, you'll probably be familiar with a term which is called ETL, extract, transform, load. So pulling data from somewhere, doing something to that data, and loading it somewhere. Now, this is a term that's been around for ages, I think at least the 80s. Uh, it's nothing particularly new. Um, but what's caused people to start talking about data pipelines, in particular in the fairly recent past, is that obviously the amount of data and the amount of these sorts of things that are happening is growing at a crazy rate. And more and more, we're being asked to build these things in our day-to-day -day work. And generally, we're looking for two properties. The first property is uh, automation. So we want this, our ETL operations, this, this extraction of the data, the changing of the data, the loading of the data, we want that to be happening uh, automatically, maybe according to some sort of schedule or in response to certain types of events. We don't want to be thinking about running these ETL operations. Gone are the days where you give the DBA a call and tell them to run a bunch of stored procedures. Uh, we just want the stuff to be we need it to be happening on a regular basis. And then along with automation, there's of course tooling around reliability and making sure that that automation doesn't come at the cost of uh, bad things happening. And then the second thing that you probably wanna be thinking about, and um, I think this is quite a subtle point, is that we often want modularity in relation to that. Anyone who's ever had to debug some stored procedures in the depths of a database somewhere that hasn't ever been ver properly version control um, will appreciate <laughs> that the more explicit and the more clear we make these things, the more we break out the different concerns and the different things that we're trying to do as part of our ETL operation and maybe conceptualize them as a series of distinct steps, the easier it is to uh, automate them, but also to think about them and to work with them going, going on. Um, oh, oops. So um, I found this great GIF, um, and this is really you know, why I think we want uh, data pipelines and why people are talking about data pipelines. And I must admit, this is mesmerizing. I can stare at this thing for uh, hours. Um, so what we're interested in, and I think it's a very common concept, and it's interesting how these things come up again and again. It c happens right down at the low level, on the chip level, in the operating system, and now we seem to be replicating it further and further up the stack is the idea of distinguishing between our control versus our data flow. So in this analogy over here, the stuff on the, the pipeline, the cakes that are coming out the other end, all the input ingredients, that's our data flow. That's the, the stuff that we're reading in and we're doing stuff with and we're doing things to. But it's useful to think about them separately from the robots, the guys, um, the control. You know, how do, how do we organize and control those robots? How do we put them in particular places? How do we decide when the guys in the tent in the middle, took me quite a while to spot that, uh, sprinkle stuff on in relation to the other things that are happening on the rest of the pipeline? Um, so this is now a much less pleasing diagram, which uh, I drew on the plane last night, um, which gives you an idea of one of the data pipelines that we have, which is on the left there in gray, uh, we have some production database in the data warehouse. Um, we're then doing some sort of extraction into, a, uh, in, in, into some sort of object store. 
Then we want to do two steps. Essentially, we want to do some sort of cleaning and fixing up of the data. Um, and in this case, a nameless proprietary software vendor has decided that nulls don't exist and that white spaces are the right choice for when you need to uh, indicate that there's no data in a particular field. So of course, one of the steps we want to do is properly uh, turn those white spaces into nulls. Another thing we might want to do is, for example, take a date which has been saved as an integer for reasons that and this same proprietary software vendor believes, and turn it into a proper ISO 8601 compliant timestamp. Um, then we'll want to put that data somewhere, and that, that's all of the data stores are marked in the red. Um, then we want to do an augmentation step, right? Where we might want to take, say, um, addresses in this data set, perfectly well-formed string addresses, things like number two, Second Avenue, and we want to call out to something like a geocoding external service, and we instead want to um, get some nice uh, co linear coordinates, which we can Cartesian coordinates that we can work with. And again, we might want to put that data then somewhere where we can get to it. So we've built some data pipelines, and this has been our experience that. Um, the approach I'm about to tell you about, this approach of using Airflow uh, along with Docker, that worked pretty well from zero to five data pipelines. And when I say data pipelines, I mean things that are processing several gigabytes at a time uh, and are running multiple times per day. Um, after that point, we found that we needed, we ran into scaling problems. Uh, and of course, the go-to solution when you need to scale is to use uh, Kubernetes. I must admit, we actually moved to Kubernetes fairly reluctantly. Uh, and uh, this is also just a quick punt for my colleague Riaz's talk uh, later, where he's going to talk about setting up a bare metal uh, Kubernetes environment, uh, which is what we, we run our data pipelines on. But I'm not going to go into too much detail about the Kubernetes setup. I'll leave Riaz to cover that in far better detail than I can. So to talk quickly about um, why you might want to use Airflow. So the first thing to ask is, what is Airflow? It's an Apache project. It originates from Airbnb, which hence where the name comes from. Um, and essentially, what Airflow does is the control flow of your data pipelines. It has nothing to do with data. And they have this in like big bold letters at the top of their documentation. So I suspect this, this is a misconception that happens a lot. But what they do is they say, you should express your control flow as a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, which is what this thing is over here. And that's actually a screenshot from inside the Kubernetes tooling. Um, where you conceptualize each step of your data pipeline as a task, and those are the little blocks, and then you have dependencies between those tasks. You can't loop back on an old task, because that would create a cycle in your, your DAG. Um, but what it lets you do is it allows you to express how you want your control flow to, how your control flow in the data pipeline to work. Okay, so now the question is, why might you want this? Why is it desirable to have something like this? Well, you can do cool things like this. Um, you know, why not just use cron is, is the question you should be asking yourself at the back of your mind, I think. And is that you get some sort of visibility. So each of these lines here are different tasks within the data pipeline, and you can see the little lines connecting them. And then um, each column in this thing, each of the, in the, with the nice little green blockies there, is a particular run of that data pipeline. So you can see at a glance how your data pipeline is doing, how the different stages have worked. And in this case, it's not too interesting because uh, it's all green and everything seems to be happy. But actually, a case like this is far more interesting. You can see that we had some sort of service outage, uh, and we had a whole bunch of tasks that have failed. And then you can see the pink blocks at, ahead of it, which are the downstream tasks which got skipped because the upstream tasks failed. Um, and that visibility is very powerful. Anyone who's tried to do a series of ETL operations using cron will know that you know, it can become a bit of a nightmare and you end up writing very complicated bash scripts with lots of ampersands in them to try to uh, recreate the same thing which here is represented nice and cleanly. Um, but then you also get another type of visibility, which is very nice, around performance. So this is the, one of the data pipeline I was talking before. And what you can see is we've got our different tasks. Um, and you can see how they're taking differing amounts of time. And you can actually see that um, there's some tasks which are running very frequently, hence they're very spiky. And then we've got a task up there, a very slow running one that gets run every now and again inside the data pipeline. It runs once a day, so that's got a nice smooth line. But you can see, uh, we get very immediately, you can take a look and see, okay, how are things inside my data pipeline executing? Clearly, there's some sort of bimodal behavior where um, 
some t the tasks generally take us a baseline amount of time, and then sometimes it spikes up. And it might be interesting to investigate why that's happening. Oh, oops, I keep pressing the wrong arrow. Again, okay. another nice reason to use something like Apache Airflow is its expressiveness. So it's very easy to, for example, come up with a complicated structure where you have some tasks that run, and then you can actually have a task which can decide, OK, am I going to go down one branch or am I going to go down another branch? Maybe you've got a task that checks the quality of some data. And if the data quality is fine, it can send the work off to go down further downstream. Or it might actually need to do some data cleaning tasks. So that thing, I could do a check to see if there's any nulls in my data, if, not any, if there's any white space columns in my data set, and I might decide, OK, I'm going to go off and uh, null those out before I proceed with the rest of the pipeline. And then you can have nice join points. So you can have quite a rich way to describe the control flow that provides you with a nice abstraction. So all that you're thinking about when you're looking at a picture like this is how is my pipeline structured? How am I controlling how my pipeline unfolds? You know, you're not thinking about uh, what might be in table X or why, you know, what's going on in table Y, which is very possible when you're staring at like a, some, a stored procedure in the context of a database, uh, some sort of database tool. In this case, it's very clean. All you're focusing on is the control of your generic process, right? Okay, so if you've decided to use Apache Airflow, the, probably the most common way and the way that certainly the docs mostly talk about is that you run a standalone service. Well, actually, there's two ways that most people talk about. You either run it locally. So you have Apache Airflow running, it spawns a thread, and when it needs to do a, well, when you're doing a task, it spawns a thread, and that thread goes off and does work and comes, you know, completes at some point in the future. Um, Obviously, separation of things is desirable, um, but you know, that, that's, that's relatively easy to get going. Um, the thing that you might want to do after that is um, you might say, OK, I'm, I've actually got a cluster of machines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use something like Celery or something like Dask or maybe even Spark. Uh, I'm going to set up a cluster of machines, and I'm going to offload work from my, air, my, my Airflow. It's going to be like my task controller, and it's going to dispatch work to these things. And that introduces a fair amount of complexity. You're going to need some sort of message broker to dispatch work to those guys, so something like Redis or TaskRabbit or whatever. Um, no, wait, RabbitMQ, sorry. <laughs> and then um, you, and you're going to need to maintain those clusters. You're going to have to worry about the states of those workers that are getting the work and are then actually doing it. So we decided, we actually thought of a slightly different approach, which was to say, could we use this with uh, Docker? And the way in which you use it with Docker is that, I'm just trying to think if I put it in, oh no, again, the way you want to use it with Docker is you want to take your task and you want to give it straight to Docker and you want to say, run this bit of work inside a Docker container. Because you can do that with a Docker run command, you have all your arguments and then at the end you just put a command and it runs that command, the container executes the command and then it goes away. Um, and we thought this was a nice idea for a few reasons. The first one being dependency closure. So you might have, for example, quite a heterogeneous environment. Maybe you've got a couple of different stacks. Maybe you've got, so you've got some uh, Debian with Java, a, a Java-based thing running. You probably won't run a Tomcat inside a data pipeline. Um, but then maybe you've got a, a legacy c -sharp thing, bit of work that you need to do. So you've got an Ubuntu stack with .NET on top of it. Um, and then maybe you've got some static binary that you need to run that runs nicely with Alpine Linux. And the nice thing is that you can bundle all of this into a Docker image. You can either build that image yourself and store it in your own local repo, or you can you know, run it via Docker Hub or some, some, something in the cloud. And um, that thing gives you that nice dependency closure. You don't need to worry about, have I got a worker that has all of the right libraries at exactly the right version? Per task, you can work out exactly what you need, and you can specify it easily. And it's all captured inside the Docker image, right? Um, you also get, uh, and the, the sort of sysadmins, and now I suppose the guys are called DevOps engineers, uh, will like this bit, is you get some really nice um, resource-efficient isolation. The whole point of Docker is it's container, it's process isolation, right, or con process virtualization. So if you have this, like, madcap data science team that's pulling in all these open source libraries and doing crazy things, uh, 
That's fine, because what you can do is you can lock down their workers so that they can run their pipelines. And even if that library has some malicious code that's you know, uploading your company's financials to some web server somewhere, it can't do that because you've tied it off and you've isolated it. Um, it's also isolated from everything else in your system, so there's not a lot that it can do. So we think that those two reasons are really attractive for running uh, Docker, for, for, for using Docker to wrap those task runs inside uh, Airflow. So then the question is, why Kubernetes? You know, why do you want to then throw something else on top? And again, this, the paradigm is the same here, but instead of saying, take this task and run it inside Docker, and maybe you're just using your local Docker daemon, um, you actually say, take this task and run it on my Kubernetes cluster inside a pod somewhere. Um, and the reason for this is uh, one word, and that, that's scaling. So this is actually a screenshot from our current cluster. All of the gray little bubbles, those are s servers, and all of the blue little things, those are, our, um, those are particular pods that are particular tasks inside our airflow. And what you can see is that I've got no message brokers. I've just got a Kubernetes cluster. Well, just a Kubernetes cluster. Um, <laughs> we've got a Kubernetes cluster, and all that airflow is doing is talking straight to that Kubernetes cluster and is offloading work to that cluster. Spinning up pods, they do the work they need to do, and then they go away. And we can add as many um, worker nodes as we like to this, machine, uh, to this cluster, and it'll just carry on distributing the work across those nodes. If you have maybe specialist workloads, things like the need GPUs, for example, and some of your nodes have access to GPUs, then you just use the built-in Kubernetes affinity scheme. Uh, something else that we got when we moved to Kubernetes was we hadn't really invested in the Docker secrets, and we hadn't looked at the secrets management side of things, but the Kubernetes secrets management was really, um, we found very straightforward and very easy to map into this world. And sort of on a related note to that, um, the Kubernetes namespaces also allow for the potential for yet another level of isolation. So maybe you want to have tasks that are running that are, um, you know, that, that maybe need to talk to services, but you don't want to give them broad access to your whole cluster. You can use a Kubernetes namespace to potentially uh, keep them still relatively tied down. Okay. So it's all very good to talk about this in theory, but uh, how can you actually get going with this right now? So I'm going to just step through some examples of uh, some of our uh, setup, you know, how we're using this right now. So the first thing you need, um, you need a, uh, some sort of data science, uh, free and open source data science environment. Um, and that should be pretty self-evident. You need something that can run things like Docker, and you can set up things like Airflow, and you have access to the network and things like that. So you need, you need somewhere to actually do this. Um, and then in terms of Airflow, you need to have an Airflow that's set up in this particular configuration. Um, you need something called a local executor. So in the Airflow world, an executor is like your task engine. It's the thing, your scheduler. It's the thing that actually runs your tasks and decides when they're going to be executed and under what conditions, et cetera. And uh, the reason we say you need to use the local executor as opposed to one of the other ones, for example, there's a Celery executor or a Dask executor, is that um, we're going to be using local threads inside the Airflow instance to talk to things like the Docker API or the um, Kubernetes API. Which, talking of which, the next dependency is you're going to need the Python SDK for, for talking to those things. And the reason we say the Python SDK is because uh, Airflow is, is written in Python and the um, DAGs, uh, the, the DAGs, the way you create those DAGs and specify them is actually as a Python script. So you need to uh, have that. Then if you're running the Docker mode, so you're just going to be using Airflow to offload work to maybe a local Docker daemon, you're going to need rewrite access to the Docker socket. Um, and that's var run docker.soc. And if you're running Airflow inside a, um, if you're running Airflow inside a Docker container of its own, because it turtles all the way down, um, you can just mount the Docker socket from the host through to, to that container if you want to do it that way. There's, there's a couple of different ways you can skin that. Um, if you're running the Kubernetes API, again, you need read-write access to the Kubernetes API. Um, but if this all sounds complicated and a bit confusing, don't worry. Um, we've also put together a, a doc, Airflow Docker image, which currently is, uh, the current version of it is all set up for running inside the Kubernetes mode, but you'll just have to revert a few commits and you'll get back to the, the, the sort of this Docker run mode of it. And we've got quite a bit of documentation there about how we ran this. So if you're keen to get going, feel free to, to give that a spin. 
Um, so then to run inside the um, this Docker mode, um, this is just the, I put the, the pipeline up there that uh, I was talking about before, the one that fetches the data, does some fixing operations on it, then augments it, and then sends the data somewhere. Um, you're gonna need a Docker image with dependencies um, that you're going to be able to run the tasks inside your pipeline. Um, and there's kind of two approaches you can take. So per task, you can come up with a bespoke Docker image that you're going to run that has exactly what's needed to run that task. Or you can take the lazy approach, which I'm going to be honest, we do, um, which is to build a Docker image which has quite a lot of dependencies in it and just reuse that. So we have a Python Docker image that is packed with a whole bunch of libraries that we often use all the time so that we just run our tasks inside that one and it's generally the safe choice. Um, then we need, uh, inside your, uh, you actually need your code that you want to run inside your task. And you're going to need a bash script, invariably, of some sort that you're going to use to execute it. And this is actually the entire contents of one of those bash scripts. So all you can see, we've got our shebang line, we've got a nice white space because I'm a Python guy, and then we have a, a line of code where we're just running some Python, a Python file in a particular module inside there. How you get the code inside your Docker image is again up to you. We just use a git pull on the, when the container starts up. Uh, alternatively, you can have a scheme where you maybe uh, bake it into the Docker image, or you can have something where maybe it fetches, you, you inject a command that fetches the relevant code from, I don't know, S3 or something. Okay, uh, alternatively, uh oh, before I move on, this is what the code looks like inside the Airflow DAG. So the Airflow DAG is actually, the code is not much more than this. Um, we have a function up there, which is actually running the Docker task, and you, the, probably the most important thing is that block of code you can see in the middle there, where I'm, I'm saying to a Docker client, please run this thing, and you're giving it a command, and you're giving it a Docker image usually to run there. Um, and then what you do is you wrap that in an operator, and an operator is like the class for the tasks. It's how you describe your generic tasks that are going to be run. And I'm using the Python operator because I'm just giving it that Python function above, and I'm saying, when it's your time to run, just run this Python function above, which then in turn runs the code inside Docker. Okay. Um, then for the Kubernetes version, again, you just need a Docker image which has all of your dependencies inside it. And again, you need that script to run it. So there's actually no difference between what you need to run in the Docker mode versus what you need to run in the Kubernetes mode. The difference is uh, inside the DAG, um, Kubernetes, there's actually a built-in operator. And there's actually a very a vast galaxy of operators out there which do all sorts of things, that wrap all sorts of behaviors. Um, so you might want to actually, uh, particularly in relation to using various cloud services. Um, but in this case, I happen to be using one which spins up a pod and all it does is it creates a pod with a particular image and you can inject a command into it, which is exactly the behavior we want. So all we're doing is we're spinning up a pod, we're injecting our command into it, it does its work, when it's done with its work, it goes away. And that's, uh, we found that that works really nicely. Okay. So, um, why is this probably a bad idea? Uh, it's always worth thinking about, you know, where things are, problems that we've run into so far, right, with this. The first thing is that the story for loading DAGs into Airflow, so how you tell Airflow about new bits of work, um, that's, we've, we found that a bit clunky so far. Invariably, it's, you basically need to get a Python script into a Docker container if you're running the DAG inside Docker. And in our case, because we're running Airflow on our Kubernetes cluster, we need to copy it into a persistent volume claim, right? Um, that's a bit messy. We could probably automate this a lot better with a CI tool of some sort, um, but then it raises some questions about maybe what sort of testing or what sort of processes and permissions you should associate with that. So we haven't got great answers to that yet. Um, this is particular to the Docker mode. When we were running it, we were just running uh, Docker on a particular host. It was a big host. It had lots of cores. It had lots of RAM. Uh, it had lots of storage. We thought, great, uh, we're just going to run against Docker on this one. And that was fine, but we sort of struggled to come up with a good story about how we would scale to multiple Docker hosts. And I suppose probably the easiest thing to do would have been to uh, rather use the Docker API and connect to those hosts remotely, but then that introduces questions about credentials management and giving access to the API to the Airflow container, et cetera. So there would have been complexity there too. Um, 
And then probably the thing that pushed us over the edge, because those other two things were sort of like Sunday afternoon projects which you take on sometime, um, was weird performance problems that we encountered. And it was probably due to the fact that we're running everything on one host, but there's the straightforward noisy neighbors. So if you have multiple pipelines running according to varying schedules, there's going to be times when those schedules collide and you have two big jobs that run at the same time. Again, using the Docker API, you can limit the amount of performance that these guys need. Um, but uh, that's, still, uh, you know, that, that's still a bit more admin and a bit of reasoning that you have to do. Then there's the uh, heavy load on the Docker daemon. Admittedly, we were running a slightly old version of Docker, so this might have been fixed in subsequent uh, versions. But we found that uh, every now and again, we had to bounce our Docker daemon, which means you have to bounce all of your containers, um, because it just got really gummed up and slow. And then the final point was that, um, and this is a really deep and important point that you know, took, us, took me many months to appreciate, that containerization is not virtualization. You're using the same kernel underneath. Um, you are doing all sorts of interest. There's, there's all sorts of interactions at a lower level in the operating system that, because you're, you're still isolating your processes, but there's still another, there's a layer of interaction where invariably your various containers can interfere with each other. And this manifested for us as very weird IO performance. So generally our IO was running two to three times slower than it should have been. And the best answer we could come up with was because of the fact that we were running a lot on a single host, and if we, when we moved them to adjacent machine, virtual machines, they would be fine, but when they're on the one machine, things wouldn't be so good. Okay, so yeah, you know, we don't have all the answers, um, but that, that's sort of where we ran into problems, and you know, this is the, those are the pitfalls to look out for. Okay, so how to do this better? So, you know, something that we are very clear on is that we need to the bar we needed to beat was that for six months to a year, we had to do almost no administration work on our airflow setup. So anything that we were gonna do, we wanted to keep a comparable level of effort. Not only are we lazy, we're understaffed, so you know, we, we don't want to, uh, <laughs> we don't, we don't wanna give ourselves work. So one solution we thought was to move to some sort of serverless container setup, something like AWS Fargates, where we could just fire up containers in the cloud, get them to do work, and then they go away, and we don't have to care about them. Um, but then uh, another option that we thought about was, and this is the route we went down, was to say, well, if you have Kubernetes and you've got Kubernetes running for other reasons, you can amortize the cost of setting up that Kubernetes cluster, because it probably costs you something, <laughs> um, by you taking advantage of this. And this is the, the, the route we took, and we have no regrets, because on top of our Kubernetes setup, our airflow setup probably only added a couple more hours. So we really got good bang for our, it helped us get more value out of our Kubernetes setup by doing it this way. Um, then I thought what would be a very interesting thing, and I'm going to cut this short because I'd like to take a question or two, is um, that I had an idea around some, a more declarative approach where you have some way of specifying your data pipeline, like the Airflow DAG, but you have some way of declaring what state you would like the data to be in, and then you had a recon engine that talked to various microservices so that as new data came in, it would push them through the various services to get it into the desired state. Um, but that idea, as it remains, is like a bunch of scrawled lines in my notebooks, and you've seen my handwriting, so the chances of it actually <laughs> seeing reality is, 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 is very low, I think. But yeah, that's the thing we thought. So um, yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, any questions? Uh, ooh, we have a mic. Yeah, so we have, do you have two mics? Uh, one in Shondell, that's the other one. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, no, we didn't. Um, I'm not familiar, but as long as Docker, it provides a, an API, right, that you... Yeah, that would work, I think. Um, the thing, the question I think would be that, is there a nice airflow operator that someone else has written for you? In this case, I think the Kubernetes airflow operator was written by Bloomberg. Um, so we got a whole lot of their nice software engineering for free. So, yeah, that... But, but I would do anything that allows you to offload work and maybe as part of your existing setup, I think is attractive. Like if you have Hadoop running already or Spark running already, it probably would make sense to maybe look at that as your way of offloading the work. Hi. Oh, I was yeah. trying to find out what's your, op your operating system of choice when running this? 
Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, that's a, it's another good question. And this is actually something that Riaz, I think, will get into a bit more detail in his talk. Um, but what we have is we have servers that are running Red Hat. And then on top of those servers, we have, because they're quite big machines, we split them up into VMs that are running CentOS. And those, CentOS, those, those VMs are pretty much just running uh, Docker and Kubernetes. And that's our cluster setup. So we're distributing work to, you know, the work is being done across those various machines. Okay, so I mean, like, is it Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, or is it, are you just running KVMs on it, or? Yeah, it's just KVM. Yeah. Which might explain some of our weird I.O. stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Ah, yeah. um, did you benchmark uh, the, the web, well, the cloud services versus your own cluster? What was that? Oh, that's uh, another great question. Um, unfortunately, we're not allowed to use the cloud <laughs> um, because of, yeah, it's a, maybe a story, a story over a coffee break. Um, so, no, we didn't get a chance to, to actually give them a go. Um, but I think the, the talk earlier was very uh, valid in this regard, the keynote, you know, in that I think thinking in a broader approach, this approach is incredibly agnostic. I could imagine this working across several cloud providers. Um, so I would uh, think that, you know, regardless of the different perf differing performance that you might see, and you might have a favored one, I think it's still desirable to have the ability to chop and change and fail over where necessary, right? Another question, did you attempt sub-DAGs at all? Uh, sorry? Did you attempt to do sub-DAGs? So you can uh, have a full DAG and then you want to do separate? Yeah, generally, our, if our pipelines haven't gone in that complex. Um, so just so what you can do, a concept inside uh, Airflow, is you can have your DAG, but inside your DAG you can abstract it further by grouping various operations together into what they call sub-DAGs, so that you can look at your high-level picture or you can drill into specific ones. Um, yeah, but we, none of our pipelines have required it so far. I'm generally, you know, I like like flat things, so I would probably split, the moment we started hitting sub-DAGs, I'd probably start asking, do these pipelines all need to be part of the same thing? Can, should we maybe be splitting these things apart? Have we inadvertently introduced some serious coupling inside our bigger system, right? So. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> uh. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so I wanted to know, you don't consider uh, running your containers as a uh, root having a security issue? Uh, well, none of these containers are running as root. Um, the only potential security hole, which, which I fully cop to, is that the Airflow, the Airflow service either needs to be able to talk to your Docker daemon or your Docker API or your Kubernetes API. But uh, particularly in the Kubernetes case, we've using Kubernetes namespaces, we've only given Airflow permission to run pods in particular namespaces. And then the way we vend secrets is we only vend the relevant secrets to the relevant namespaces. So we've kept things quite nicely partitioned. And assuming that their security promises hold up, um, you know, and I don't think that should be taken for granted, it should hopefully be um, you know, relatively secure. But I think it's something that it's, it's always good to think about, right? And keep, in, you know, keep asking, is this as safe as this can be, right? I think we're good. So just... Hi, uh, so obviously you're a bit far down the road, but did you look at Mesos or Mesosphere at all? I, I know that people tend to say that Kubernetes is a bit more general purpose and Mesos was more the data science focused cluster at one point. Any ideas around that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, I, I remember seeing a Mesosphere talk in, at ScaleConf a year or two ago, and just the other day I was thinking, oh, I should look at that again. Because um, that was actually very much our story, and I think you know, Riaz will speak to this in his talk a bit, where we were very reluctant to take on Kubernetes. We heard that it was a lot of administrative pain, and that you know, we figured that what we're doing was straightforward enough that we didn't need to uh, move to it. Um, but we started hitting all of these scaling-related problems, and that's sort of what caused us to look. And Kubernetes we had been keeping an eye on, and it was at the point where we thought, actually, we can bring this up with just the right amount of pain. 
Uh, and I think actually our sort of judgment there actually held up, bore out, which was quite nice. Um, but yeah, I think we, you know, it would be an, it's a good suggestion. Thanks. I think we'll definitely check it out. Okay. Um, thank you um, for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Our time is run out. Yeah. Thanks right. for that. And thanks for the questions, everyone. Um, thank you. Yeah, a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah, and apologies for